Well, I'm thrilled to be here as part of your Biosciences Day. And I know many of you have had a long day already because there have been lots of presentations and discussions. And I was fortunate uh, before coming here to go and spend a little time in Can's lab and hear about some of the work going on there uh, from her students and postdoc. And that was great fun. And the energy that I could sense uh, about their research is infectious. And it should be. And this is truly a remarkable time uh, to be involved uh, in biosciences. We can ask questions that people would not have dreamed being able to ask a few years ago, and we can even answer them sometimes, which is really a remarkable experience for those of us who've been watching this and participating in it over the course of two or three decades. Some of you are just getting started in this path and may not realize just how glorious uh, this situation is in terms of the kinds of answers that you can derive the kinds of technologies you have to guide you, the insights you can get into how life works and how sometimes disease occurs. But this is indeed a golden time for anybody who's interested in the life sciences. So I'm glad you're having this Bioscience Day, and I'm certainly grateful to Eric and Joyce for having made this particular keynote presentation possible. What I thought I would do is first give you some kind of big picture perspective uh, from the director of the NIH about where some of the excitement is going. But obviously, this is going to be very sort of limited because it would be many weeks if I tried to cover uh, the, the whole landscape. But then I'll talk about a specific medical challenge where basic science and clinical medicine have kind of all gotten together in an interesting way as an illustration of why I'm so excited about the potential uh, for science right now at this uh, time in history. So that maybe that'll make it a little bit more specific and a little bit more real. But first of all, I do want to walk you through uh, some of the things, maybe on the larger picture, that perhaps we could all consider together here about why this is an exciting time to be involved in bioscience. Well, the NIH, which I have the privilege of leading, is the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. And it has this dual mission, which is pursuit of fundamental knowledge, that's the basic science part, but also the application of that knowledge to extend healthy life and reduce illness and disability. So it's everything on that spectrum, from very basic research to clinical trials and everything in between. And one of our challenges is to be sure that all parts of that ecosystem are healthy. Now, NIH, as you probably know, is up here at its main headquarters uh, in Bethesda. But most of the money that NIH uh, doles out doesn't go uh, to our intramural campus up there in Bethesda. It goes to lots of institutions, like the University of Maryland. And uh, in fact, 88% uh, of our almost $30 billion is distributed in grants, which support the research that many of you are doing right now. If you look across the nation, uh, that means that uh, NIH dollars are in all 50 states, although some states that have more research-intensive universities and institutes uh, tend to receive more of it, because that's where the applications come from. Uh, you can see Maryland is uh, in one of the colors there that is particularly blue, which means lots of dollars are flowing in the direction of this state and, and for great, great good purpose. And not only do we support research within the U.S., having heard uh, that Eric and Joyce Young are also interested in global health, I have to point out that we also support research in many other countries of the world. Uh, as you can see in this picture, everything in green here are countries where we, in fact, have some research going on supported by NIH. We think we've been pretty successful at this, and you could decide what you think the criteria for success might be. Well, here would be one. Uh, these are the Nobel Prizes that were given six weeks ago uh, in 2013. Uh, Rothman, Schechman, and Sudoff uh, for physiology or medicine, all three of them NIH grantees who did the work that won them the Nobel Prize with NIH support. Chemistry, Karplus, Levitt, and Warshall, also NIH grantees. So we were, we were a clean sweep this year, six out of six, and that often is the case. Now 144 uh, such uh, researchers have become Nobel laureates. Most of those are more in the direction of basic science. That's often what the Nobel recognizes. Uh, but you could also say, well, what has NIH done for the public? We are, after all, supported by dollars that come from taxpayers that the Congress decides each year to allocate uh, are we, in fact, living up to that promise of advancing human health? Well, depending on how you look at it, uh, the answer is pretty dramatically yes. This shows you what's happened to life expectancy in the United States over the course uh, of the last 40 years. 
uh, where you can see this steady upward climb. We want it to continue that way, and we worry a bit that the current epidemic of obesity uh, may flatten this out or even cause it uh, to go the wrong way. But the, hit, the track record here is really quite impressive. Now, what are those reductions in deaths from? Why are people living longer? A big part of it is heart disease and stroke. And in fact, uh, oh, by the way, if you're interested in economics, uh, that's also worth a lot of money. Uh, heart disease and stroke have fallen by 60% in deaths over the last half century because of things like the Framingham study that taught us what the risk factors were for heart attack and stroke and enabled us to begin to make interventions. Obviously, NIH is not the only player that contributes to that change, but we are a major source of the evidence that then guides efforts uh, to try to help people live longer. HIV AIDS, uh, many of you in this audience uh, have not uh, been around long enough uh, to remember what it was like in the late 1980s, where if you were diagnosed as having HIV AIDS, your life expectancy was about one year. Uh, now, if you're diagnosed uh, with HIV in your 20s, you're likely to live to age 70 plus as long as you have access to the antiretrovirals, which were developed by NIH in collaboration with the private sector in a very intense uh, program in the 1990s that is now saving millions of lives uh, around the world, not just here. And cancer, we're seeing increased survival rates for breast cancer, cervical cancer, colon cancer, other cancers. In fact, cancer rates are now falling about 1% per year. We want them to fall faster. Again, if you're looking for return on investment, those $30 billion that NIH spends every year on research are dwarfed uh, by the amount of dollars that are saved by these advances in medical uh, benefits to the public. So it's a good track record, uh, and it is an amazing time in science. When I came to this opportunity to serve as the NIH director four years ago, I thought long and hard about exactly what areas might be most ripe uh, for special emphasis. And out of that, I wrote this article, which is actually holding up pretty well, which is remarkable in a field that moves this quickly. Uh, this is now from four years ago, laying out what the priorities might be thought of as exceptional opportunities in medical research. Uh, and this is just a short piece in science if you want to go back and look at it. So first of all, technologies. And maybe it's particularly appropriate to come and talk to a school like Maryland because this is a place where technologies are invented. You have phenomenal capabilities uh, in that regard. Technologies have tended to be, in past years, sort of put down a little bit by biologists, like, well, you know, that's for those engineers and other people, but no more. Biology now increasingly is driven uh, by these wonderfully powerful technologies that allow you to see things you couldn't have otherwise. And certainly we need to think about how to stimulate even more of those, whether it's in genomics, uh, whether it's in imaging, uh, whether it's in single cell biology, uh, whether it's in understanding uh, such things as, as uh, microRNAs, all of these technologies seem to play a significant role in advances. Stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, look at the way that has completely changed our ability to study biology and understand development. So that's one of them. A second one, which has been a particularly uh, interesting and at times controversial issue, is how do we make sure that the basic science discoveries that are pouring out of laboratories all over the country and all over the world get translated from basic science into clinical benefit and don't just sort of sit there? Because uh, there's a long uh, history here of a very, very slow and oftentimes a non-existent process to take those discoveries and bring them across what's called the valley of death uh, into something that will help a patient. And do we have the right mix right now uh, of activities between the private sector and the public sector to achieve that sort of translation? Uh, it seemed to me that while we had a lot of that going on, there was at NIH no hub for that activity. And so we started two years ago a new center, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, as a hub for that sort of activity to identify where the bottlenecks are that are getting in the way of translation and to try to do something about those collaboratively uh, with all of the other research components of NIH and with the private sector. And that's actually going quite well. A third area is we are supposed to be the place that generates evidence about what works and what doesn't work. And if you want to see a healthcare advance in this country and in any place else in the world, you want to build it on an evidence base. And that's what, in fact, NIH has done for many years. And we need to be sure that we're continuing to identify the places uh, where there is a gap in knowledge, which if we filled it, would actually provide a better outcome for millions of patients who are sort of waiting for the right kind of care. So that is also a component uh, of our mission. 
And again, coming back uh, to something mentioned as near and dear to the hearts uh, of Joyce and Eric Young, for me also, encouraging a greater focus on global health, recognizing that we at NIH uh, can't be so totally focused on our own country, recognizing that as Julio Frank has said, domestic and global are not opposites of each other, they're actually very overlapping. Uh, we have a chance here in, in a fashion that can help the lives of hundreds of millions of people to also pay attention to what's going on in the rest of the world. And fifth of the five, and perhaps most important of all, is that none of those dreams will come true without invigorating and empowering the biomedical research community. By that I mean all of you. That great ideas and great opportunities aren't going to happen unless there are people uh, who are trained and excited and passionate and willing to take some risks to get that done. And that is a very important part of what we at NIH try to do through our training programs. And that includes training in a wide variety of disciplines. It includes training people from a wide variety of backgrounds. And we're particularly focused right now on how to be sure we're doing our job correctly there, especially as we are in a difficult budgetary time until our Congress decides uh, to get past the current impasses on fiscal deliberations. It is a little tough here in terms of the amount of resources, and we have to be sure we're using them as wisely as possible. So that's kind of the big NIH overview here of where some of the exciting science is going, but obviously in very broad strokes. And now I want to try to turn this into a story, a story about a particular medical biological challenge and uh, walk you through uh, some of the detective work uh, that went on uh, to try to get an answer that continues uh, to reveal surprises uh, even to today. So I'm going to uh, talk about a, an example of a story it's a rare disease. It required some serious genetic sleuthing. It required a dedicated and creative interdisciplinary team. This couldn't have been done without expertise from a variety of directions. It required some biochemistry. I'm not a biochemist. I'm a geneticist, so that needed help from people who understand how to do some of those assays. Some cell biology. Mm, I could dabble in that, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. Mouse model had to be created. There needed to be some designer drug development. My goodness. Some good fortune happened along the way. That's always nice when it occurs. <laughs> and perhaps most importantly in terms of the fact that we started with a very rare disease, if you want to say, what do we learn from this? Well, we're learning things that affect not just the kids with this rare condition, but also all of you. And maybe because of the introduction, you'll have some idea where I'm going here. I'm going to talk to you about Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome. I first met progeria in the form of this patient, Meg Casey, when I was a genetics fellow at Yale yeah. 30 years ago. Uh, I was assigned patients to take care of in the clinic when I got there, and one of them was Meg. And she was, uh, at that time, about 20 years old, which is older than most individuals uh, with progeria are able to get to. Average survival is only about age 13. And uh, she, like everyone I've ever met with progeria, uh, was uh, precocious in her intellectual development. She was sharp as anybody you ever hoped to meet. She could also be very sharp-tongued, which was fun to uh, watch on occasion when anybody tried to put her down because she's only about three feet tall and had a voice that sounded rather childlike. Uh, you would not want to treat Meg in that fashion, or you would unleash a stream of obscenities, which would quickly remind you that this was an adult. <laughs> She almost single-handedly, uh, because of her emphasis on, on making facilities accessible to the disabled, uh, transformed her little town of Milford, Connecticut into one of the leading uh, urban areas for making sure that those facilities were taken care of. And I was both captivated uh, by trying to take care of her and also frustrated because there was almost nothing that I could read about that told me what to do. Uh, her bones were melting away. Uh, she had clearly some signs of cardiac problems that were not entirely clear. And I knew from reading the literature on this disease that she had already outlived the normal expectation. And yet there was really no specific therapy and no understanding whatsoever of the disease. In her case, as in virtually all other families with progeria, there was no, no uh, family history. It came out of the blue. She had seven siblings. Uh, none of them had the disease. So I took care of her for a couple of years. Uh, I left, uh, went off uh, to a faculty position at Michigan, uh, later found out a couple of years later that she died at age 26. And sort of filed that away as, boy, that sure would be nice uh, if somebody would figure something out about that disease. Well, time passed. And then in the year 2000, at one of those typical Washington events, 
I was introduced to somebody who was doing a White House fellowship who was an emergency room physician and who told me after he learned that I did something with genetics in the Genome Project that he hoped that someday this might benefit his son who had a disease he was sure I'd never heard about before. And that was Sam, his son, who has classic Hutchinson-Guilford progeria. So I was stunned that because it is such a rare disease, only occurs in about one out of every four million births, uh, that here we were. Uh, and here was a little boy with progeria whose dad was an ER physician, and it turned out his mother was an MD-PhD and had just decided on the basis of this diagnosis that she was going to change her career uh, from something else to studying this disease and trying to come up with answers to it. So Leslie Gordon, uh, Sam's mom, uh, convinced me to try to provide some advice about how we might actually try to get an answer to what caused this disease. And the more I tried to provide advice, the more I got intrigued about maybe my own lab might start to do something in this uh, area. So Hutchinson-Guilford progeria, I've mentioned a couple of the features, and they're clear from the picture. Loss of hair, diminished subcutaneous fat. By the way, you see the pictures in the upper right. Those are sequential photos of the same individual. And he, he's holding those pictures in his hands. Now, it's about the age of 13 when this is taken. So as a newborn, uh, these kids look essentially normal. By the time they're one or two years old, you can tell something isn't right. They stop growing. The hair starts falling out. And they develop other skeletal abnormalities. And most seriously, they develop heart attack and stroke as the cause of death, usually 95% of the time, uh, by about age 12 or 13. Uh, so what to do? never recurs in families. All the tools that a geneticist would use to try to map this to a particular chromosome are of no use. Uh, Maria Erickson had just arrived in the lab as a new postdoc from Sweden looking for a project to work on. Uh, Mike Erdos, who's here in the front row, uh, who's been my uh, lab uh, guru of almost everything for the last uh, 30 years, or 20, I guess. It's not quite 30 yet, is it, Mike? Uh, has uh, also got engaged in thinking about this a bit. And we decided, okay, let's take a year and see if, by trying some experiments that are probably going to fail, we might actually get to learn something about this disease. That was a fascinating year, and it was almost a whole course in human genetics, the way it all turned out. And I will spare you all of that and just show you what the answer ultimately turned out to be, because it was stunning. The answer turned out to be that virtually all kids with classic progeria, like Sam, have this single nucleotide change, one letter out of three billion, uh, that is supposed to be a C, but instead it's a T, as you can see in the diagram here. Now, when you look at that sequence, and it's in the coding a region of a protein called lamin A, you would guess, well, that's probably going to change an amino acid. Well, you'd be wrong. Remember, the genetic code is degenerate, and so when you actually look up and see what the reading frame is here, and what the code would tell you, actually GGC and GGT both code for glycine. So anybody who saw this and wasn't sort of suspecting something to be going on here uh, would say, well, that's probably nothing. So why did we think it wasn't nothing? Well, because we found this same mutation in multiple kids with progeria. And we had DNA from the parents of quite a few of those kids. And the parents had the normal sequence, the GGC. So this is a de novo mutation, a spontaneous single nucleotide change in this one place, and every time it pops up, the kid ends up with progeria. That's got to say there's a cause and effect here. You can't uh, see how to get around it. But how could that be actually causative? Well, we stared at the sequence uh, and uh, pretty quickly came up with a hypothesis, uh, which fortunately turned out to be right, or I probably wouldn't tell you about it. Uh, and, and that is that this sequence not only codes for protein, but it also has another interesting kind of motif here, and that is splicing. Uh, those of you who know something about basic molecular biology know that genes are transcribed uh, into RNA, and then they're spliced in a way to remove the introns. And the sequence that tells you where the junction is between an exon and an intron is usually what you see here at the top, where there's a G in the last base of the exon. Whoa, I think I didn't mean to do that. This is a dangerous laser pointer. Uh, oops. So that G is in the last base of the exon. And then the first two bases of an intron are almost invariably GT. And then after that, either an A or a G. And then after that, a G T. Now, if you look at the normal sequence, it, you know, it's got some matches there, but it's off uh, by two out of those. Whereas the mutated sequence, 
in fact, gets that much closer because that T now means this is a good match for a splice donor except for one place where it doesn't fit. So we postulated that this would, in fact, potentially explain what's going on, that this mutation creates a splice donor in the middle of the intron, I mean, in the middle of the exon. And as you can see in the diagram down below, what that would do would be to cause a splice out of that exon to the next exon, which happens to be the last one, exon 12. And counting up the nucleotides, uh, we determined that that would actually splice over and remove, therefore, 150 nucleotides of exon 11. How many of you just divided by three? <laughs> that would be a good thing to do. 150 is divisible by three, so that means you're still in the same reading frame when you get to exon 12. You would still be able to have an RNA that could be translated into a protein. It would have the last amino acids from exon 12 correct, but it would have an internal deletion of 50 amino acids. And okay, that sounds like a plausible hypothesis. Can you prove it? Many of you who do these experiments would go, well, yeah, duh, you just do an RT-PCR, and that's what we did. So you make RNA, you make some primers, you look to see, can you show that the RNA exists that is missing uh, those 150 nucleotides? And here's the experiment, and sure enough, the lanes marked H1 and H2 are RNA samples derived from fibroblasts, which were taken from kids with progeria. The other lanes there are normal, except the last one is a HeLa cell line. And you will see the bright band where you'd expect it to be for normal splicing of exon 11 to exon 12. And then the smaller band, uh, which is present in H1 and H2, uh, is what you see just as we had predicted by the activation uh, of this splice site within exon 11, therefore producing this RNA that's missing 150 nucleotides. So that says uh, that this would make a protein that's deleted with those 50 amino acids, but why would that be so bad? This must be an awful protein if it makes kids age this way and stop growing and all the other calamities that occur. You could say this is a toxic protein. Why would it be toxic? Well, here's where it is a really good thing that other people had worked on this protein for a long time and were able, therefore, uh, to teach us stuff about how it would be processed and why this particular deletion might have consequences. Because it turns out, that lamin A is one of those proteins that has post-translational modifications. You know, you transcribe into RNA and then you translate into protein on the ribosomes, but sometimes you're not done yet, and this is one of those where you're not done because there's two other steps that happen before you end up with mature lamin A. Now on the left, I'm showing you what happens normally with lamin A. That is, it gets translated. It then has at its carboxy terminus uh, this signal which in this case is cysteine, serine, isoleucine, methionine, CSIM, which is what we call a CAX box, and that is a signal for the addition of a hydrophobic hydrocarbon called farnesyl uh, to that cysteine. Then you'd cleave off the last three amino acids, the SIM goes away, but then another unusual step, another cleavage occurs, and this is done by an enzyme called ZIMST24, named after its homology to yeast. And what it does is to remove uh, the last 15 amino acids and that farnesyl tail. And so the final mature lamin A, 72 kilodaltons, doesn't have that hydrophobic tail anymore. And that becomes very important. Now, why is the, why is the cell going to all this trouble? I mean, why, why do we have, why did evolution require this protein to have this uh, series of steps? We're not entirely sure of the answer to that, but we have a pretty good cartoon. And namely that that farnesyl tail allows this protein to find its way to where it needs to be, which is the inside of the nuclear membrane. But not to stay stuck to the membrane, to be cleaved off and then to float around. I'll show you the picture in a minute as part of the scaffold that exists just underneath that nuclear membrane and gives the nucleus its shape and does a whole lot of other interesting things. So apparently, this is sort of like a zip code. The farnesyl zip code says you need to be on the inside of the nuclear membrane, but then you want to get rid of that so that it can occupy its mature form. Well, what happens in progeria? Remember I said the deletion is internal. You still have the right amino acids at the end, uh, but you have that missing piece in the middle. So you still have CSIM. You still get farnesylated, that hydrophobic tail's on there. But when the enzyme comes along to cleave and knock off that tail, the recognition site is not there because it was in those 50 amino acids that got spliced out. So you end up, the final protein, which we call progerin, is permanently farnesylated.
permanently got this hydrophobic tail that's going to stick wherever it can find a membrane to live in because it won't be happy otherwise. And it sticks there, and it attracts other proteins that normally bind to lamin A with it. And ultimately, what happens, you can see quite dramatically in the nucleus of cells as they go through many passages. Namely, the nucleus gets increasingly lumpy and bumpy, and you see these herniations and abnormalities. That's what you're looking at here. Uh, these are single cells from a fibroblast culture from a child with progerium. P6 means they'd only been passaged six times, so they haven't had to go through mitosis very many times. But as the passages go further and further along, you can see the nucleus getting more and more abnormal. This is being stained with a laminate antibody, but mostly just to show you the shape. The western blot down here below uh, shows you that at least in this experiment done by our colleague Bob Goldman, that it's pretty hard to see progerin in the early passage, but as you get further along, uh, you see a clear band there, which corresponds exactly to what you would predict the lamin A protein that is missing 50 amino acids. Lamin C turns out to be a protein that's transcribed from the same locus, but actually terminated upstream of this so that the progerin mutation doesn't affect lamin C. Well, okay, all of that was actually possible to determine within about a year uh, of discovering the cause of the disease. But we both wanted to understand the biology, and we hoped to be able to do something to help these kids. So what could we learn from what we've uh, discerned here about these pathways, building on the uh, work of others, uh, to figure out what might actually be an intervention? Well, we went back to our diagram, and we recognized that that protein at the bottom is the toxic protein. That is what you really don't want to have uh, in your cells. Is there something we could do to at least reduce the amount of it? Well, you have those steps. So what could you do? Uh, you wouldn't want to uh, sort of uh, 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 cut back um, the, uh, the uh, normal amount of lamin A if you could help it, but maybe you could dial it back a little bit. And so we postulated that if you could avoid creating molecules uh, that were not going to be able to be processed, namely progerin, we might be able to help the disease. And so what would you do to accomplish that? Well, uh, the, uh, the protein that does this transfer of that tail is called Farnesyl transferase. And so a Farnesyl transferase inhibitor, if you had one, might be a good idea. Well, are there Farnesyl transferase inhibitors? Sure enough. Oh, thank you. This one maybe won't, uh, won't press the, well, I'm probably pushing the wrong button. We'll see. Uh, it turns out that there were, in fact, Farnesyl transferase inhibitors that had been generated by a number of drug companies uh, over the preceding, oh, 15 years. Why would they have done that? Certainly not for this rare disease. Well, it turns out there are other proteins that are farnesylated. This is not the only one. In fact, there are about 200 proteins that have this post-land translational step. And in fact, one of them is the famous oncoprotein called RAS, the first oncogene, which also goes through this process. And so it was considered maybe if you could prevent farnesylation of RAS, you could treat cancer. Uh, that didn't turn out to work uh, for complicated reasons, but a lot of effort went into developing the drug. So we talked to some friends uh, in the drug industry and we actually managed to get a few of them uh, to offer us up uh, some of their compounds, none of which had actually ever gone through FDA approval. They were still in clinical trials. In the first experiment, which was done by Brian Capel uh, when he is an MD-PhD student in the lab, was just to see could those compounds make cells look happier. I mean, you've got to start somewhere, right? So you have these progeria cells growing in culture. You try adding a little bit of one of these FTIs, and you wait a couple days and then look at them to see whether that lumpy, bumpy nucleus is starting to look better. Well, I got to say, I was not expecting this to work, certainly not to work in 72 hours. But here you see two different uh, progeria fibroblast cultures exposed to the drug, one micromolar or two micromolar, over 72 hours. And this very abnormal morphology essentially uh, gets very close to normal. Apparently because there's enough turnover, uh, so that even though you're starting out with a lot of progerin, because there's turnover and you're making less of it with further uh, cell divisions and uh, the, the cells going forward, you can normalize to a large extent you know, what was a very abnormal looking nucleus. So that was exciting. But of course, that's cell culture. You're going to go from that to a patient? Well, you could, you could argue that, and we started to. But we also wanted to see what would happen in a mouse that we created to have progerin. So how to do that? We had big debates about that. What's the right way to make a mouse model for this? Mouse has a lamin A gene, to be sure. 
Could we mutate the laminate gene in the mouse to create that single nucleotide change? Yeah, we could. It would be a bear, especially back then. It's easier now with things like CRISPRs. Uh, and we weren't even sure that if we mutated that single base in the mouse that it would activate a splice site. It might not have the same uh, outcome. So instead, we decided to make a transgenic. But of course, we wanted to make a transgenic that would make progerin at about the right level in about the right tissues. So those of you who've done some mouse engineering will know that's not trivial. You could just make the laminate gene, but you have to have a promoter. You have to tell it where it's going to be on and how much. And that could be a very complicated business. So instead, we took a very big piece of DNA that contains the laminate gene, but it's on a 164 kilobase piece of DNA. We reasoned that somewhere in here, because laminate is transcribed this way, are probably the regulatory signals that would make this properly expressed in mouse tissues. There's some other genes on here. We had to worry that we're creating a transgenic not just for a single gene, but also for some other things. And then we inserted into this back, as it's called, a bacterial artificial chromosome, the mutation that causes uh, progeria, which you can do uh, by some recombineering. And we made a mouse transgenic to see what would happen. And I won't show you uh, dramatic pictures of the mouse because actually the mouse didn't look too bad uh, with a single copy of this back. Uh, the mouse uh, did not have all the features, but what it did have was early death from cardiovascular disease. And of course, that is the thing that we most hoped we could prevent in these kids, so that was actually a pretty good outcome. So uh, that gave us a chance then to try the drug in an animal model, not just in cell culture. Let me show you pictures of what the progeria mutation does uh, to the mouse. Uh, this is uh, pictures of the aorta at, a, at mice that are nine months of age. So this is wild type, a normal mouse. The lumen, that is where the blood flows through the aorta is here. This is the wall. And if you've never looked at uh, sections of an aorta, it's really quite a complicated structure. You have these elastic lamellae, these wiggly things. And then you have cells in the media, which are vascular smooth muscle cells. And here they're stained with both a lamin A antibody to make them sort of pink. And they're also stained with a DNA stain, uh, so they're blue. You can see blue and pink together. And then the green is smooth muscle alpha actin, a major protein of vascular smooth muscle cells. So that's what they ought to look like. Different picture here, but same idea. In the transgenic animal at nine months with progeria, it's very different. You still see those elastic lamellae, but they are acellular. They're just sort of left there. There are no cells in the media. The vascular smooth muscle cells are all gone. Interestingly, you can still see some places where lamina is staining, and we think those are basically tombstones of cells that used to be there and kind of left their protein behind, but the DNA is gone and they're gone. And there's no green staining for smooth muscle alpha actin. So this, this is an acellular aorta. And if you look at the rare autopsies that have been done on kids with progeria, that's what you see in their aorta as well. The vascular smooth muscle cells of all the cells in the body seem to be the ones that take the greatest beating uh, from this particular protein being present. Okay, now we've got a way of testing the drug. So we started giving farnesyl transferase inhibitors uh, to mice, the transgenic mice, at the time of weaning. And we waited and then we looked to see what would happen. And uh, to our delight, uh, we really got quite a dramatic benefit. Uh, here is an example. Obviously, you want to look at lots of animals and be sure that this is consistent. Uh, they weren't always quite this beautiful, but most of them showed very substantial benefit from the drug. So apparently, by dialing back the amount of progerin, because we're giving this farnesyl transfer in race inhibitor, which is pre preventing the full uh, production of that, you can, in this mouse model, prevent uh, this very serious aortic damage. Okay, well, Farnesyl transferase inhibitors have actually been around for a while, as I said, and they've, at least a couple of them, have been given to kids for other reasons, clinical trials for cancer primarily. So there was enough experience to say that these are probably drugs that could be given over a substantial period of time to children without major consequences. There are some GI side effects that can be significant, but you can get past them. And so it was proposed and the FDA approved uh, to go ahead with a clinical trial and these are the 28 kids uh, who were uh, signed up uh, to take part in, in this uh, initial trial. And it was very hard to find these children. Remember I said one in four million. I'm not sure if that's quite the right number. But in fact, to find this number of kids, uh, the Progeria Research Foundation, which of course was founded by Leslie Gordon, Sam's mom, 
I had to go not just to the U.S., but outside the U.S. Uh, to find some of these kids. The trial was conducted in Boston at Dana-Farber. These kids were flown in and uh, started on the drug and then brought back regularly to see what would happen. And of course, you want to know what to expect here. You would hope uh, to see some benefit. It would be hard to imagine that suddenly these kids are going to start to look like normal kids because they've already had this disease for some time. But the thing we most wanted to, to hope for uh, that was that there would be some kind of benefit to the cardiovascular system. And I'm happy to say we were not disappointed. And this trial uh, was, in fact, uh, published uh, a year ago in terms of what was seen uh, over the course uh, of uh, a couple of years of following these kids on this therapy. And perhaps the most significant finding is this one, uh, which shows uh, a parameter called pulse wave velocity. Now, what is that? It's basically a measure of the stiffness of a large artery. And in progeria, those become very stiff. So the normal uh, pulse wave velocity would be like here. The stiffer the artery is, the faster the blood flies through because there's no distension to sort of slow it down. So you can see the kids with progeria all had abnormal pulse wave velocity at the time of initiating the treatment. And after the treatment, with um, rare exceptions, uh, they went down significantly. A couple of them stayed about the same, and one of them went the wrong direction. Uh, but that is a highly significant result. And that tells us, as did some other things uh, from ECHOES, uh, that this did seem to be providing benefit, at least for the cardiovascular part. Some of these kids also gained weight. Not all of them did. There were some other parameters followed, uh, which you could read about in that piece uh, of uh, publication. So we felt pretty good about that. And more recently, Leslie Gordon has been looking at survival and has now estimated that it looks as if the kids on the trial, and it's an open label trial, so all the kids are getting it. It's not randomized. But compared to historical controls, these kids appear to be living substantially longer, perhaps five years or maybe even more uh, than what you would have expected. So that's all good. And we felt uh, like this is an amazing path to have traveled in just uh, basically about eight years from the time of discovering the ge genetic cause uh, to having a result of this sort. But we're not done yet because clearly uh, this is an improvement, but it's not a cure. Are there other pathways that could be tried uh, to try to see what we could do about the disease? And uh, here is where uh, particularly uh, Can uh, and her uh, uh, golden hands in terms of doing experiments and having great ideas uh, got engaged in trying to figure out what we might do as far as another approach uh, to therapy. And that was to try this drug, rapamycin. Rapamycin was becoming famous because of its ability uh, to result in increased longevity. And so, of course, we have a problem with longevity. Why not try rapamycin? Uh, but there are some other reasons as well to think this might be a useful approach. And this paper uh, published in Science Translational Medicine uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, with Ken as the first author, uh, in fact gave us some very encouraging results. Again, you can look at just cell morphology, and you can see what happens. These are progeria cells just treated with a mock, uh, just a vehicle. And here it is with rapamycin. And the difference is really quite impressive. And again, you can do this quantitatively over here, looking at the percent with nuclear blebbing. Uh, the uh, first look at the progeria cells, uh, with they're just treated with mock vehicle, about 30 to 40 percent of the cells are, are blebbed, uh, whereas with rapamycin it goes down very substantially. Interestingly, normal fibroblasts also have a proportion of blebbed cells if you have them at the same passage number, and that actually is improved also by rapamycin, which we didn't necessarily expect. And Ken was also able to show that if you then just see, can these cells survive longer? Because progeria cells die early in culture, just like the kids seem to have aging in vivo, the cells do also in culture. And here with rapamycin, it was possible to show that over the course of treatment, these cells kept on growing uh, when the mock treated cells basically stopped. So this is encouraging, and we are in the mix right now of testing rapamycin in the mouse model. Uh, and we don't have the results yet, and hope to quite soon. And certainly there's intense interest on the part of the Progeria Foundation in trying a trial that includes both Farnesyl transferase inhibitors and rapamycin. How does rapamycin work, by the way? Well, we're not sure we know all the answers, but one major way is it seems to activate autophagy, and it seems that it's therefore able to keep cells uh, in happier circumstance by cleaning up the progerin aggregates that seem to accumulate 
in the cytoplasm after cells go through many mitoses where the progerin gets stuck and doesn't find its way back to where it's supposed to be. At least that is a reasonable theory. I'm not going to show you the data for that part. Because, yes, time is moving on, and I have another thing I want to tell you about, which is why this matters, not only for these kids with progeria, but for you. Remember I promised there was going to be a connection? Well, if you sort of came to this uh, thinking that you're going to be immune from aging, I'm sorry to tell you uh, that uh, evidence would suggest, uh, based on my observations and that of anybody who's been on the planet, that we're all doing this. And the question is, does this story about progeria have any relevance to what's happening to normal individuals? Is progerin actually expressed in you or me? Well, if you were hoping the answer was no, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> it's yes. In fact, I already showed you the data, but I didn't point to it. So here we are again, that same RT-PCR gel that I showed you a while ago. Those uh, cells called N1 through N4, those are normal fibroblasts from supposedly normal people. And if you look uh, with a little bit more of close attention, you'll see there's a band in the same place as the big fat progeria, progerin band that you see in the kids with progeria. And in fact, you can cut that out of the gel and sequence it. It's progerin. So we're all doing this. We're all activating that splice site, even without the mutation, at a low level. Now, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe it's just sort of noise. Maybe it doesn't have any function. Well, we didn't kind of like to know the answer to that too, wouldn't you? One thing you could do would be to make an antibody which detects progerin and doesn't detect lamin A. And efforts have been done by several groups over the years, including CAN. One of the early efforts uh, was done by our colleague Karima Jabali, who then used that antibody to see in elderly people, can you actually show that this protein is present? And sure enough, you can. And in fact, in young people, you don't see it, or you see it rarely. And as somebody ages, if you look at a skin biopsy, you see more and more of these cells in the dermis that are making progerin. So it's not as if all cells are making exactly the same amount. It looks as if there's something that happens as cells are getting further and further along in their lifespan where this starts to turn on. Hmm, what's that about? How would a splice site uh, know what age you are? Hmm. Well, we're not sure we quite know the answer to that, but Ken came up with a very clever experiment to try to understand this. This is the most complicated experiment I'm going to show you, but bear with me. What you want to know is, does that splice site get activated differently in different cells? So you need a reporter of some sort. And the reporter is basically this construct here. It has part of the lamin A gene. It is not the progeria mutation. It's the normal sequence. And then it comes to a stop uh, if, uh, in fact, uh, the splice is not used. You've inserted a stop there. This is going to be important. Exon 12 is still there. And then there is fused to it, still in frame, uh, a GFP, so that you'll end up with a green color if you make it a protein of that sort. Then there is uh, a sequence here that allows the ribosome to re-enter and make another protein, in this case, a red uh, dye, DS red. So if you transfect that into a fibroblast, and if that splice site is not being used, and remember, this is the normal one, it's not the progerium. So if it's not being used, uh, you would then translate across here and you'd come to the stop, and you would never get to the GFP. But you would still make the red, but you've got this iris here, which allows the ribosome to start over again. So that would be a cell that would be red. But if you had a cell that was actually using that splice donor, that cryptic one, it would splice into 12. Still in frame, it would get to GFP, and it would make green. It would still make red as well. So you can transfect this into cells, and then you can do a fact sorting. And you can sort which ones are red. That tells you it got the construct, but didn't use the site. And which ones are green and red. And those are the ones that are using this site. So it gives you a report, a way of understanding in any given cell type is this splice getting used or not? Well, we did a lot of fun experiments with that. I'll just show you one, uh, which I think is maybe uh, particularly relevant to this question about what happens during cell aging. Uh, this is just the percent of double positive cells, the green plus red, as a function of passage number. These are normal fibroblasts, and the further they get along in passage, the more double positive cells they make, all the way up to like 25%. So up here, they're using that cryptic splice a lot. Down here, not so much. So there's something that's happening in the course of the lifespan of those cells that there's like a clock ticking 
and the more the clock gets towards the end of the cell life, the more this splice site's getting activated. So what the heck is that? Well, I have to now romp through a whole bunch of quick experiments in sort of one summary slide. So one question you might ask is, what else do you know about molecular events that lead to senescence? Well, the one big thing that we knew about senescence is about telomeres, those tips of the chromosomes, which tend to get shorter and shorter as the cell divides, because it's hard to replicate that part unless you have something called telomerase around. And the shorter the chromosome tips get, the telomeres, uh, the closer that cell is to senescence. So uh, might it, in fact, be the case that there's some correlation here? So Ken did that experiment and showed, actually, there's quite a nice correlation. The shorter the telomeres uh, as cells are aging, the more, more of those double uh, uh, green and red cells we see, the more activation of that splice site, uh, the more production of progerin. OK, that's one question. If you prevented telomeres from shortening, take cells that are already far along in their life and actually put a telomerase in there, which allows the telomeres actually to maintain their length and not to get shorter, does that actually prevent that splice from being used and prevent progerin from being made? It does. So if there's clocks here, but they seem to be connected. The telomere shortening is somehow connected with the progerin activation. If you stop one, you seem to stop the other. Other flip side of that is if you actually force telomeres, well, not actually to be short, but to be uncapped, uh, where they expose uh, their, uh, their odd DNA structure, which is what really causes short telomeres to cause trouble, uh, in early passage cells, does that turn progerin on? I wasn't sure about this one. Uh, the result was pretty dramatic, and this is a paper uh, in JCI, again, um, mostly Cann's work. Uh, what we did here was to transfect cells, this is another complicated experiment, but bear with me, with something called TRF2, TRF2 delta delta. So it is a form of a protein called TRF2, which normally caps uh, telomere, kind of keeps it covered up, so the cell can't tell whether it's getting ratty or not. The dominant negative basically blows that shelter and uh, protein apart, and so the tel telomere is exposed. And sure enough, uh, when you transfect cells with normal TRF2, uh, there's no production of progerin. This is a Western blot, laminase C. This is a loading control. But when you transfect it with this dominant negative that uncaps the telomeres, progerin gets produced, actually in a pretty significant amount. So it looks as if we have a significant connection here, that something is connecting progressive telomere loss with activation of splicing to produce progerin and other alternatively spliced genes as well. It's not just this one, and we have not as yet sorted all of that out. There's also other things that telomere loss does, like activating p53. Ultimately, the result is cellular senescence. So a conclusion might be here that, in fact, We've hit upon a mechanism where aging of cells is not a passive running down of the system. It's an active process. And progerin plays an active role in hastening the exit of cells that are approaching senescence, something which might be a good idea, because as you're approaching senescence, you're making more mistakes, you have more chromosomal breaks, you're at risk of going from normal to malignant. So maybe it's a good idea to just say, you're done. <clears throat> And progerin seems to be in the business of saying, you're done. And it turns on fairly strongly then as you get closer and closer to the point where exit would be appropriate. Well, I've lingered quite a bit on that. And um, I want to quickly move uh, to a conclusion here and also to say uh, a bit about who did all this work. I think this does tell you, though, that William Harvey was right uh, when way back in 1657, <laughs> pointed out how important it is to study rare diseases as a window on nature. I won't read the quote here for you. You can read it, but certainly uh, he makes the point here. There's hardly any better way to understand how biology works than by studying cases where something dramatic isn't working. And then you can work backwards from that to infer something else, which is pretty important. And certainly the study of this very rare disease, which may affect at the present time only about 100 kids that we know of in the world, has now taught us something that affects all of us in a significant way that might ultimately lead to some pretty interesting interventions. Well, I've mentioned um, CAN, and I should uh, 
mention her again, and she hates this picture because it was taken at the time that she was pregnant with Kevin, who she mentioned in the introduction. She looks much better now, but uh, anyway, <laughs> Can has been a phenomenal contributor uh, to this work, and her lab continues uh, to knock back the frontiers of understanding this disease and its the role of progerin in aging in really remarkable ways. Mike Erdos, uh, who's here, uh, has been a significant part of this uh, whole enterprise from the very beginning. Uh, Stephen Lichtenstein was a postdoc in the lab. Amanda DeBose is the current postdoc who's doing the work on rapamycin in the mouse model. Roca Tavares uh, does all of our mouse work, uh, remarkably gifted at that. And Melissa, who's here, also spent some time at NIH and has bounced back and forth between NIH in Maryland and uh, played some very uh, significant roles in some of the uh, work that I told you about. And it's great to see Melissa here uh, today in College Park. If you um, uh, want to see lists of other people, we've certainly had great help uh, from other assistants. And I particularly want to mention Leslie Gordon, uh, the head of the Progeri Research Foundation. And if you really want to get a sense of what this is like from the human perspective, I don't know if any of you got to see the HBO special called Life According to Sam, uh, which aired about a month ago. Remember Sam, the three-year-old that I met uh, when his uh, dad was at a reception? Well, this is Sam today. Uh, Sam just turned 17. Uh, Sam is a straight-A student in his high school, and he plays drums in the marching band. And uh, he, of course, is on these clinical trials and has done remarkably well, and is quite a remarkable philosopher about life and other things. Uh, so if you get a chance to see a rerun of this uh, Life According to Sam documentary, you should definitely do it. Finally, because I know I'm talking to a lot of students here, and it's great to be able to do so. Uh, you're, you're hearing a story from me about a pretty interesting area of research. It could have gone one way, could have gone another, and I'm, I'm glossing over lots of places where this was incredibly frustrating, and we went down blind alleys and made mistakes and had hypotheses that were wrong and experiments that failed. So don't imagine <laughs> that there's anything uh, here uh, that it doesn't reflect probably your own uh, daily experience. Uh, that's the nature of science if you're tackling something interesting and difficult. But maybe a few principles for success as students in particular are trying to find your path uh, forward at a time of great scientific opportunity, uh, but also wanting to make the most of it. First of all, identify an appropriate project. And I would say, don't just pick something that's sort of obvious. Pick something important, ambitious but achievable. Now, it's easy to sort of say those words. It's harder to actually identify a project that meets that. But again, you only get to sort of live out your career in science one time, so may as well do something uh, that you think you can get excited about uh, that is important, ambitious, but achievable. Mentors are just absolutely critical. I've been fortunate through my career to be mentored by remarkable uh, people who taught me many things about what's a good experiment, uh, about what's worth pursuing, about how to pick yourself up <clears throat> when you've had a really disastrous uh, few months in the lab and everything's gone wrong, which has certainly happened to me. Uh, so you want somebody who's accessible, available to meet with you, help you build a, sort of your own uh, pathway as far as acquiring domain expertise, courses, collaborators, introduce you to other mentors. We all get mentored by lots of people, not just one. And provide you with opportunities to present your work and assist you with publications. And maybe most difficult but most important, expect to fail. It is part of the experience. It's very hard when you're first starting out to have an experiment that you have labored and dreamed about just go completely belly up. Uh, but it's going to happen unless you're doing something really uninteresting because uh, <laughs> it is the nature of what we do. So expect to fail. It's OK to feel kind of put down about that. But then learn from the failures because sometimes that's the most important part of your experience is those failures. Why did that happen? What did I not think about? Why was my hypothesis flawed? Oh, why didn't I think about that control? All of those kinds of things. That's where you really get to be uh, a fully mature, uh, capable, uh, rigorous scientist. Well, as for the future, I don't know where it's going, but I'm fond of this particular quote from the guy who wrote The Little Prince. As for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. I can't foresee it, even though I'm supposed to know something about that as the director of the NIH. But I hope to enable it. But I think the way it's going to get enabled is really by all of you. Thank you all very much. Questions? Do you want people to use the microphones or just shout? Yes. Yeah.
So the question, in case you couldn't hear it, is why does it take so long uh, for this abnormal protein uh, to manifest its consequences? I'm, I'm not sure we have a complete answer, but I think we have a little bit of it. You saw those cells in early passage. They looked pretty good. But then over the course of time, they start looking rattier and rattier. Uh, can actually look closely to see what happens during mitosis. Because of course, the nuclear membrane and the scaffold has to come apart during mitosis, and then it has to get back together again. And it seems like each time you go through that, it comes together a little bit less well. And I think it sort of then makes sense. If you have a protein that's involved in nuclear structure, the worst thing for that cell is to have to keep copy copying its nucleus because it gets it increasingly wrong each time. So what you see in cell culture, I think, is probably what's happening in kids as well that cell replication for them, which is supposed to be a normal part of life, is actually the beginning of the end. Yes? So one in a million is quite rare, but still much more frequent than the background in age. Is there something special about that? That's a great question. So one in four million is rare, but still it seems like it's higher than the background rate you'd expect for a single nucleotide out of three billion to mutate. You would, I mean, it's breathtaking to imagine that this one single base has happened this many times. It turns out uh, the sequence, which I didn't quite show you the whole thing, uh, this sequence is part of what's called a CPG dinucleotide. So the C that mutates to a T, the, the sequence was C followed by G. It is probably the case that that particular C is methylated, as many CPGs are, and that's an easy one uh, for DNA uh, to miscopy as a T. So those are the most mutable nucleotides in the genome. So this is way above the background rate, but it's exactly the place where it might happen. Same thing happens in achondroplasia, by the way. Uh, achondroplasia, which is frequently a new mutation, same idea. It's a CPG, which is independently mutated uh, in kids with this disease. By the way, it almost always happens in spermatogenesis, which is, sort of makes sense as well, because that's where you have more DNA copying going on. Over here. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Either one. So, do you have any, any theories for uh, intervention for global aging? Ha! Huh. Well, <laughs> should we put Farnesyl transferase inhibitors in the water? Uh, <laughs> along with statins, I guess everybody's now going to supposed to take statins. Um, not yet. Uh, I mean, basically, Farnesyl transferase inhibitors I don't think are going to be a great answer because they do affect the processing of these 200 other proteins, which can't be entirely good. Rapamycin, or maybe one of its rapalogs, uh, like uh, something called Everolimus, certainly a lot of people interested, since that seems capable of extending lifespan of mice and other animals as well. So we might be going somewhere in that pathway, but I would go really slow. Imagine how you would uh, carry out that clinical trial, where you don't know what the side effects might be, and you have to wait 40 years to find out whether it worked. Not, not an easy one. Back here. <laughs> well, that was the slide I skipped, but since you asked about it. <laughs> uh, so we looked at centenarians uh, to see, is there something special about their laminae gene? We didn't see anything right at the site of that splice donor, but we did by looking just at the sort of genetic landscape, the so-called haplotype, uh, able to identify a haplotype that appeared at a higher frequency in centenarians than in people who had sort of average lifespan, suggesting that there might be something there uh, that contributes at least in part to the fact that extreme longevity does tend to run in families. Uh, I'm counting on that, by the way, since my parents lived to be 98, so uh, hoping this is true for one reason or another. Back here. Good eyes. What, what a great observation. So did you hear the question? The HeLa line uh, in that gel I showed you twice, that last lane uh, was HeLa cells uh, subjected to that RT-PCR. And if you look very closely, as this person did, uh, there was no band there for progerin. And in fact, if you do a very careful, careful high uh, intensity, you can see almost none. Well, guess what? Those are the cells that have long telomeres, because uh, HeLa cells make telomerase, and they're immortal. 
And in fact, if you look at cell lines that are immortal, they don't make progerin. It all kind of fits with this idea that this gets turned on uh, as cells are approaching the end as their telomeres are getting short. Back over here. And then I'll come over here. Yeah. Oh boy. So the question is, this was an open label drug trial. All 28 kids got the drug. There were no placebo controls. Uh, we had an intense and I must say somewhat painful debate about this. And, and I will tell you, I was opposed <laughs> to the open label trial. I, I thought we should do this in a randomized double blind crossover uh, where kids would get the drug or a placebo for a couple of years and then we'd flip and they'd go to the other and we'd keep the uh, code uh, 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 secret. Um, the parents and represented by Leslie just couldn't see how that could be justified. These kids have such a short lifespan. Many of them were already uh, at sort of age nine or 10 uh, where by normal longevity predictions they were nearing uh, what might be the end. They just didn't think they could possibly agree uh, to having a kid take a placebo if there was some promise here. So uh, the trial was carefully designed with that in mind. It's not the ideal from a sort of rigorous academic perspective, but in practical sense, it seemed to be the only way to do it. And this is often the challenge with really rare diseases that have very short lifespans. How do you justify a placebo when you think uh, the kid only has a few years to live? Yes. What was the average age of enrollment in the trial? Mm -hmm. And is a subsequent trial being, being anticipated where you would start treatment as soon as the diagnosis was made right. to get extended longevity? So the question was, <clears throat> what were the average age at enrollment and trial and have subsequent trials tried to enroll people as early as possible, kids? Yes. Uh, so the, the average age for the first trial was pretty much whatever you could find uh, in terms of kids throughout the world uh, that had the diagnosis. So it was all over the place. Uh, youngest was three, uh, oldest was 17. Um, the more recently, actually I didn't tell you, the Progeria Research Foundation has been running a second trial which combines the Farnesyl transferase inhibitor with a statin uh, and with a drug called a bisphosphonate which maybe helps with the bones. Uh, there they tried to enroll kids as early as possible. And there's a whole bunch of kids that have been recently diagnosed which if we can run this rapamycin trial would be ideal for that. I certainly agree with where you're going here. The earlier you get started, probably the better chance you have of benefit. One more question. One more question. Um, well, somebody's standing up at the microphone, so I think I have to recognize that I particular talking. motivation. I am not a genetist, but uh, my question is that you showed that normal aging, also progeria, is developing. And I was wondering, I think sitting there, what's the role of diet and exercise in actually slowing it down or, or somehow uh, preventing the accumulation of progeria, which are lots of uh, dietary micronutrients and microgreens and so forth in yeah. literature, it actually anti-aging research in that direction is happening. So, so for kids with progeria, I don't think we know a lot about whether diet could be beneficial. These kids tend not to grow much at all uh, after the point uh, of being about three or four years old. They essentially have uh, no further height gains. And their parents will tell you it is a constant struggle uh, to try to get them to eat anything. And so they're reluctant, I think, to try to, uh, to uh, be too specialized about that. In terms of normal individuals, you probably know um, that there is evidence in animals that calorie restriction of a significant sort results in increased longevity. That's very true in everything from C. elegans up to mice. And there's some evidence it may be true in humans as well, although that's somewhat controversial. Whether that would actually uh, result in reduced amounts of progerin being produced uh, in normal human cells if that individual was calorie restricted, I have no idea. That's not a study that has been attempted because we haven't really gotten to the point of doing that rigorous analysis uh, for humans. But it would be interesting to see whether all those things could somehow be correlated. You know, may know there's a whole literature trying to understand how caloric restriction works and why does it result in increased longevity. And there's all kinds of hormonal and genetic explanations for that. I would say it's fair to say we don't really know yet. Well, thank you all. You've stayed later than you expected to, and I really appreciated your questions. <laughs>